Hello, I'm from the Shiloh Museum, real close to y'all. And I've been asked to come and talk to you a little bit more about Native Americans in Arkansas. Everybody in here is working on Native Americans. Does, let me ask you, because I can talk about uh, uh, several different things, but do you have any particular questions about the Native Americans in Arkansas that you want me to kind of focus on? Nope. Okay. Um, so here in Northwest Arkansas, we basically had two tribes of Native Americans who spend a good bit of time in this area. Does anybody know who those two tribes are? The Osage. So some of you may have been to Camp War Eagle. Anybody Osage? And what's the other tribe? Um, Caddo. Where do you know where the Caddo Indians lived? I don't know how much she's going to move around. Very good. Okay, so the Osage Indians were here in the Ozarks. So the O and the O go together. Um, they didn't live in the Ozarks. Well, they didn't live in the Arkansas Ozarks. The Arkansas Ozarks was the Osage Indians hunting ground. The Osage Indians lived in southwest Missouri. Still the Ozarks, but that's where they lived. And the Caddo lived south of here, so in Fort Smith and south of that area. So at our museum, we don't talk about them as much because they're not in our area. But if, if you need more information about them, I can talk to you a little bit about them. But I'm going to focus today on the Osage and another tribe that came through here later. Does anybody know what tribe that is? The Quapaw were, they lived um, in eastern Arkansas. And so I'm not going to talk to you as much about them either. Because like I said, I'm going to focus on the ones here. I can talk to you about them, but not as much. The Cherokee. The Cherokees. So the Cherokee, the Cherokee came through here before and during the Trail of Tears. Some of them settled in the Ozarks. So those are the two tribes I'm going to focus on today. So the Osage Indians, as I said, they were the ones who were here first. This was not where they lived. This is where they hunted. So any ideas of what they may have hunted? in northwest Arkansas. Buffalo, bear, deer. Very good. Buffalo, bear, deer, elk. All right. They would organize their hunters. The women and children would go with them on their buffalo hunts, um, and they would organize their hunters. Everyone had a job to do. And so they would come down here, and there were buffalo in northwest Arkansas um, in the 16 and 1700s. So this is where they would hunt, and then they would go back to their village. Now their main village would be laid out with a main road going east and west. What else do you know that, tra that go travels east and west? Um, well, I'm thinking of something else that travels through the sky, east the sun. The sun. So the Osage, they believed that they were from they they were divided into the land and the water and the sky people. And so in their village, they separated by the two clans um, in the on the north and the south of their east-west running road. And um, think exactly. their houses were, what do you think their houses were made of? They weren't teepees. <laughs> we all think that Native Americans all lived in teepees. They didn't live in teepees. Straw and mud? Mm, not straw and mud. That'd be a little farther over into the plains. Clay. Think about what do they have a lot of in the Ozarks? What grows a lot? Trees. Trees. So their their houses were 
made out of wood. Not so much log cabins as long wooden log uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Can't think of the word. Long, yeah, long houses. I can't want to say log houses. Long houses. So they were kind of long, and they would have the chief on either side, or the, the head person of each um, part of the tribe on either side, and then they would make their villages from there, and then they had their farmland outside of their houses. So this, this was their main settlement. Then they would go on their hunts twice, about twice a year, and then in the winter time, they would disperse into smaller settlements. Why do you think in the winter they might have to disperse into smaller settlements away from where their farming fields were? Would they be farming in the winter? No, so they didn't need to be with their, their farmland. They had already put up their crops. They had already put them up for storage. They had gone on their hunts and gotten their meat and they preserved that. So they had the food that they most of the food that they needed, but they would disperse during the winter into smaller villages because if they still needed to hunt some or let any animals graze or um, go looking for any plants that they might need for medicine or food, if everybody was right together, they would quickly use up what was around them. So during the winter time when there wasn't as much available, to hunt or to gather, they would go out in smaller villages. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then they would come back together for the growing season and for the hunts. So um, I told you that they divided based on their tribes, and I can't tell you, I think it was the land and the water tribes um, that were on either side of the, the road but you'll have to look that up for sure. Don't take my word on that one. Um, but there, I'm going to tell you their, the Osage creation story. How do you know your history? How do y'all know your history? Websites. Websites say you, you read about it. You read about it. Any other way that you know about your history? The artifacts. You look at things that have memories and tell you about things. And what about grandpa? Your grandparents tell you the stories or your teachers tell you the stories. The Osage were a prehistoric tribe. And what that means is they didn't have a written language. Does that mean that they couldn't speak or that they didn't have a unique language? No means they did not have a written language. So they're prehistoric, pre-written history. So they couldn't use, of course they couldn't use a website, but they couldn't use books and written papers to tell their history. They relied on their grandparents, their items. They were a very ceremonial tribe. They had ceremonies for a lot of things, so they had a lot of objects, a lot of artifacts to look at that would remind them of information. But they also had their little old men. Their little old men were their wise men. They, these little old men would observe nature, pay attention to what happens every single year, Pay attention to what's happening in the skies during the daytime and the nighttime, the changing of the seasons, and listen. Listen to the stories of ev that everyone else was telling. And remember. Remember those stories. Remember those events. Remember the things that they had heard. Then if you came with a question, you could ask the little old man, and he could think and use his experience and tell you the answer to your question as best he knew. So the, the Osage Indians had a lot of stories that they passed down and they would share. The older people took the younger, the children, and taught them their stories. So one of their stories is 
their creation story. Where did the world come from? Where did the Osage people come from? And they looked around, the little old men looked at the world. Remember I said they were good observers. They looked at the world and they saw there's an upper world, there's a middle world, and there's a lower world. Does that make sense? Can you see that? In the upper world, they observed the sky, the moon and the stars, all the action, the things, the movement of the stars, what takes place in the sky. In the lower world, they could see the trees growing, the grass and the water. And then they, they knew that when they dug down planting their crops, there was something down below in the lower world. Well, the Osage have a great spirit over all the worlds, and his, he's called Wakanta. And Wakanta had smaller spirits floating around with him in the upper world. And one day Wakanta looked down at the middle world and said, something's missing. There's animals ro roaming around, there's, there's trees growing, there's grass, but something's missing. And so he sent the first Osage people down to the middle world. And those first Osage people were the smaller spirits, some of the smaller spirits who were with him, floating around in the upper world. He sent them down and said, you're going to be the first Osage people. And they landed in this big oak tree, or in a big oak tree. And when they landed, they were kind of like what grows on an oak tree? An acorn. They were kind of like an acorn. They kind of didn't have much uh, wisdom, much knowledge. They didn't know anything about this new world. And they landed from the oak tree. And when they hit the ground, they sprouted legs and arms, and they looked very much like you and me. These were the first Osage people. Well, Grandpa, uh, Wakanta looked down and he saw these first Osage people wandering around. And night came. And they, they didn't know what to do because remember, they're like acorns. And they're wandering around and Wakanta felt sorry for them. So Wakanta gave them a gift. And this is the gift that he gave them. Now what would this gift, how would that be of any use to them? Heat, kept them warm. Light, so they could see. Anything else they could do with fire? For cooking. What? Cooking. For cooking, if they had anything to cook. Remember, they're like acorns. They don't know what to cook. So grandfather's son looked down and he felt sorry for them. He said, I'm going to give you a gift. And this gift, have y'all ever seen an Osage orange? They're out of season right now, so mine, um, is, mine got all moldy. I had to throw it out. Um, but this is an, we call this an Osage orange. Some people call it a hedge apple, some a horse apple. It's native to northwest Arkansas. And it looks kind of like a green, an orange that never turns orange. It's always green. And, but the, the branches of this are very flexible. And I apologize, I didn't bring my flexible branch. But grandfather's son gave this tree to the Osage people. And they learned that they could bend it. And they could tie it part of a, a string or a, a gut of a buffalo to it and it be in a bent shape. And then grandfather's son gave them this tree. You know what this tree is? It's blooming now. It's native to northwest Arkansas. A dogwood. And the English people called a dogwood a dagwood, like a dagger. And it has nice straight branches. And they learned, the Osage people learned that they can make 
something nice and straight like this to go with their bent piece of wood. And what could they do with that? A bow and arrow. Good. Y'all have good imaginations. So then these animals that they had seen and they couldn't catch because they were too fast, they could use their bow and arrow to shoot those animals. And now they have food that they can cook on their fire. Well, the animals got together. And when the first Osage people came, the animals could talk. And the animals had an animal council. And they elected this guy to be the head of the council and to go and talk to the Osage people. He was pretty big. And he came to the first Osage people and he said, you can hunt us if you let me give you a gift. And they were kind of intimidated, so they said, all right, you can give us a gift. And besides, I mean, it sounds win-win. We can still hunt the animals, and we get a gift. So Buffalo gave them a gift of seeds. Do you know what these three seeds are? Corn. Corn. Pumpkin, a which is a type of squash. Beans. And beans. And beans. Mm -hmm. So he gave them this gift. Now, squash has big, broad leaves that kind of shade the ground, keep the sun from drying up what's underneath and the weeds from growing up under it. Corn grows nice and tall and also gives you the food. And then beans like to grow up something tall. So if you plant these three right together in one little mound, they work together. The squash is keeping the water in the soil and the weeds away. The corn is growing tall and the beans are growing up the corn. We call this the three sisters garden. Who has a sister? And you always get along with your sister, right? <laughs> These seeds get along. They work together. Your sister will eventually be your best friend. So. Why would Buffalo give them that gift if they, and still let them hunt the animals? Why did the animals want to give the Osage people a gift of corn, beans, and squash? So that they're not hunting the animals that much. Exactly. They have other food now to eat. So they're going to hunt the animals, but not as much. Panther. This is another animal native to northwest Arkansas. He said, well, I'm going to give him another gift as well. And he gave them the gift of wisdom. Remember they had started off having as much wisdom as an acorn. Not very much. So he gave them the gift of wisdom to know which plants they could eat for food, which ones they could use for medicines, which ones were poisonous. This is a native plant to Arkansas. Part of it you can eat for food. Part of it you can use for medicine. And part of it, if you eat it at the wrong time, is poisonous. So Panther gave them wisdom. And the Osage and Native Americans in general used a lot of um, native plants for medicine. Remember the underworld? <coughs> Crawl Dad came up, he wanted to give them a gift too. So he gave them the gift of red, blue, yellow, and dark or black. What are these colors? What's in the, tribe colors. the what? The tribe colors. They are the tribe colors. These are their um, sacred colors. And what do we know these colors, red, blue, and yellow, as? Not you. The rainbow has all the colors, right? It's primary colors. So these are the primary colors that you can use to make all the colors of the rainbow. Because you can put red and blue together to make purple, blue and yellow to make green, yellow and red to make orange, 
So you can make all the colors of the rainbow. So this is where the Osage, the little old men said that the Osage people got all their great knowledge. They got their ability to hunt. They learned how to use the bow and arrow. Um, and they got all the colors that they used to decorate things and their tribal colors. So this is the Osage creation story as the little old man, sort of as the little old man would tell it. <laughs> um, so, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Does anybody have any questions about Osage? Their creation, their, um, like I said, they had a ceremony for just about everything. And, this, and they passed down their history by word of mouth. Um, were there only weapons just arrows? Um, they didn't have guns until the Spaniards came. <laughs> so they, yes, they just had bows and arrows, but then they could make other things, you know, different, they could have different size bows and, or different size arrows. And they could make different tools as well. So weapons, you know, are kind of for killing, but you also have tools for other things. So this one, and y'all might have seen, um, when Ms. Carly was here, she talked about some of our artifacts. Yeah, so here's a, a hammer stone, and it's got kind of a, a piece in it. You can almost feel how they could hold it. Do y'all want me to pass it around? <laughs> And then our, um, let me see if I can quickly find it. Yeah, so a digging tool. Remember they were farmers. So here's a, a digging tool. Osage were prehistoric, 
They passed down their stories by word of mouth. What about the Cherokee? They were historic. They wrote down. They had their language written down. So the Cherokee originally lived in Alabama, Georgia, Virginia, North, Car North and South Carolina, and East Tennessee. And they saw the white settlers taking over more and more of their land. The Cherokee were fierce warriors. They were the kinds of Indians who would go out and fight, and the way that you knew that someone was a great warrior was the number of scalps he had on his belt. Y'all know what a scalp is? Oh, yeah. When they would kill someone, they would take their, the top of their heads off and tie their hair in that skin <coughs> of their belt. So the more of those scalps you had, the better warrior you were. All right, this man right here, he was a great warrior. His name was Ridge. Major Ridge. He fought with this guy right here in the Creek and Indian War. Do you know who this is? And Andrew Jackson, one of our presidents. All right. So Major Ridge fought with Andrew Jackson during the Creek and Indian War. The um, Cherokees actually did a lot of, they won a lot of the battles for the Americans because they, they were fierce warriors. They were good. But they also, then after the war was over, they saw the Americans with Andrew Jackson as the president now coming in and taking that land they had in Georgia and Tennessee. And they said, we got to stop this. There's something that these white settlers have that we don't have. And it's not that they're fierce warriors. We're better warriors than they are. What is it that they have that we don't have? And they decided what they had was magic. And you actually have magic too. Can, can you write down the name of a color right there? They looked around at these white settlers in Washington, D.C., the government, and they said, these white settlers have magic. Tell me what color she's thinking of. Green. Green? How did you know that? Is that the color you're thinking of? How'd you know that? Yeah. It's written down. This is the magic. And you all have magic too. The Cherokee looked at the white settlers and they said, they can read. They can write. They can pass information, not just across the room, but across this great country that they have. And so the Cherokee wanted to learn to read and write. And they started off by learning to read and write in English. The Cherokee, John, uh, Major Ridge, sent his son, John Ridge, to school to learn how to read and write in English. But then, this man here, George Guess, also called Sequoia, he said, I don't want to learn to read and write in English. I love the Cherokee language. I want to read and write in Cherokee. But there was no written Cherokee language. So George Jess Sequoia spent nine years developing the written Cherokee language. His wife thought, she just called him the crazy man because she said, this is ridiculous. No, not, this is one of the few languages that a single person has developed the written language for. And it took him over nine years. You can see he borrowed some of his characters from the English language. He made up some little squiggles 
but he developed the Cherokee written language. He took the language that they spoke and developed the language. Did you have a question? Um, were the Cherokee the first to learn how to read? No, there were missionaries that went to a lot of different tribes, but the Cherokee wanted to learn how to read. This was like a big goal that they had. So I don't know if they were the first to learn how to read, but they were, I can probably say that they were one of the first to become almost 100% literate. One of the first tribes to become almost 100% literate because they had such a desire to learn how to read and write. And um, they are one of the five civilized tribes. Yes? Um, well, his English name was George Guess, G-U-E-S-S, -S, or sometimes you'll see it G-I-S-T. Um, and his, his um, Cherokee name was Sequoia. So he developed this, and then he took it to prove it that it was good. Oh, well, let me tell you. First off, it's based on, ours is based on um, sounds. Our language is based on sounds. How many characters do we have in our alphabet? 26. There's 80, 85, 86 characters in the, Cher the Cherokee syllabary. Because theirs is based on syllables. So orange, one syllable. Table, two syllables. Um, purple, two different syllables. Well, no, oh, it's still there. So we we know what a syllable is, but it takes um, several letters to make one syllable. Their characters are based on syllables, and so it's called a syllabary. So he developed this. He taught his six-year-old daughter how to read and write. And then people could learn his language because it's kind of, it's simple once you know it. Um, they could learn to read and write in Cherokee in just a few, a matter of weeks. It takes, how long did it take y'all to learn how to read? It took me years. <laughs> um, so they could learn it really fast and they wanted to, so they became literate. I gotta watch my time. Um, so, John, uh, Major Ridge sent his son John to school. John ended up marrying an English, an American girl. Um, this, this is his cousin, Elias Boutineau, and he also went to an American school. And he, became, he started the first Cherokee newspaper. It was called the Phoenix. What's the name? Elias Boutineau, it's a French, he took the name of, he went to a school in New England and took the name of a French, his French teacher, B-O-U-D-I-N-O-T, I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, and he came back to North Alabama and Georgia and started the Phoenix, and it was a newspaper written in English and Cherokee. And the first edition had the Lord's Prayer and the Cherokee's um, Constitution because they were a nation within the United States. And they were a Christian nation. And they thought by becoming civilized, they dropped their fierce um, fighting ways they became civilized, they learned to read and write, they even dressed like the Americans. They didn't wear feathers and things unless they were dressing in their ceremonial dress. They went to Washington, D.C., they tried to negotiate with the president, hey, white people are trying to take over our land, can you please stop them? This is ours, this belongs to us, it always has, we haven't signed a treaty to get rid of it. Um, and we're civilized. We've settled down on farms. We raise sheep and we weave. Our ladies weave and so, but the American people, they wanted the land. And then there was a gold rush in Georgia and then they really wanted the land. And so they told the Cherokee people, you're going to have to move out. Well, the ridges, 
and the boot nose, they said, we have tried for years to negotiate with the president. There's no way we're going to be able to keep our land. Let's go on and leave. And so they sold, or they, they made a treaty where they got some money for their land. Now, the Cherokee people all own their land as a group together. And so you couldn't, one man couldn't sell all the land. Even though Major Ridge was one of the leaders, he couldn't sell all the Cherokee land. That was against the Cherokee law. In fact, he himself had helped to, to um, establish the law that if anybody did sell part of the Cherokee land, they could be killed. It was called their blood law. But he, he told the people, we've tried, we've tried, we've had all these meetings, nothing's working, we're selling the land. Come move out with us. We're going to Arkansas. So the Ridges and the Boutinos and some other people headed to Arkansas. This was before the Trail of Tears. There was another man. He was also a leader. Um, they were actually neighbors, the Ridges, and this is John Ross. John Ross was also a leader of the Cherokee people. He said, no, no, we're going to make this deal with the United States government. We're going to keep our land in the southeast United States. But it failed. And eventually, John Ross had to move out with the rest of the people on what we call the Trail of Tears. So many people lost their lives. They lost their homes. When they got to... Arkansas, by that time, Arkansas was becoming a state. We didn't want people in Cherokee settling here. In fact, they had to move a little farther to Oklahoma. They moved to Oklahoma, but the Rosses and the Ridges were always kind of fighting with each other. And in fact, there were eventually some men who came and murdered Elias Boutineau, John Ridge, and his father, Major Ridge. And a lot of people say that the, the murders were sent by John Ross. Maybe John Ross said he didn't know about it. John Ross stayed in Oklahoma. And if today, if you go to Tahlequah, that's the center of the Cherokee Nation. His home was in Tahlequah. Um, and he tried to help his people and the Cherokee people are very forgiving. And so they said, we're just going to do the best with what we've got. Here is a picture of, um, this isn't John Ross's house. This is the mural home. But this is a similar house to John Ross's. And this actually belonged to one of the Cherokee who moved to Oklahoma. So you can see they, they had wealth. They had money. They were a civilized group. <coughs> but this is what they were forced to, to do on the Trail of Tears. And these are the routes that they took, the different routes that they took to get here. Some came by water, some by land, but at least two of the groups came through northwest Arkansas on the Trail of Tears. And they all ended up over here in what's now the Cherokee Nation. So it's a really sad story, um, the Rosses and the Ridges and the Cherokee, um, and in fact all of the Native Americans, because the, um, the European Americans, they said, we're just going to make them all be like us. They have to forget all their ceremonies, all their traditions, all their ways, and be assimilated into the American way of life. And so they tried to, now they're trying to learn back their history. Any questions about the Cherokee? Their story is more convoluted, more, there's more detail to it, but it's very interesting. Once you start reading it and dividing it up, um, it makes more, more sense. If you go today to Crystal Bridges, you can see those photographs of the ridges. 
and the raw and John Ross. Oh, they not get lost. How did they not get lost? They had guides. Now this was this was the Cherokee came over in the early 1800s. Um, Arkansas by the 1820s and especially the 1830s. Arkansas was a territory, you know, we got it in the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And so there were guides by the 1820s, they had even surveyed this land because they were going to be giving it, if you fought in the War of 1812, you got land as your payment as a soldier. And so they had come through here and surveyed it and laid it out in parcels. So, um, there, and even before that, the 16 and the 1700s, there were French and Spanish explorers that had come, and so they, they could act as guides. And especially the Quapaw Indians were over here. They, they traded a lot with Americans, um, and they would act as guides. They didn't really like getting into this territory because once the um, once the Cherokees started coming in, the Osage said, wait a minute, that's our hunting ground, and they started fighting, and that's when they established Fort Smith. It was a fort to keep the Indians from fighting each other so much, kind of keep control. So they had guides. Why didn't they just go straight? It's a lot easier to travel by river. And they were trying, it was winter time, and they were trying to avoid some of the snow, and, and some of it was trying to avoid white settlers who were uh, hostile toward them, even as they were leaving their land. Did you have a question? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, you never said anything about the word for this one. Well, the, the Cherokee were given guns to help fight in the, the Creek Wars that they fought in. So they had guns and, eventually, and then eventually all the Indians, all the Native Americans had guns because they would trade. The Quapaw, I mentioned that they traded a lot and one of the things they traded for was guns. Um, there's a story, an interesting story about the um, Osage hunting on one of their buffalo hunts and they told the the um, I think he was a Spanish explorer it's or no I think it was a French explorer it's your turn to shoot and he shot and killed the buffalo with uh, one shot and the little or the little old man was so astonished what he killed it with one shot um, because they would have to gang up with a you know have a team effect to, with a lot of arrows to take down a buffalo. So they started getting wanting guns, and that was always part of the treaties was to get to get guns. Did that answer it? <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, did they have to shake out the rocks? These would kind of wear out. Now these they would chip away, and that's how we know that. Um, this is not just a rock because it had to be kind of chipped to make it the, the right shape and especially these these others here like this this just kind of got that indention from use just from constantly rubbing on it eventually it, these, this one became more round and this one became indented is that what you're asking? So some they shaped, some just wore away by use. Anything else? The Arkansas Encyclopedia online is a great resource. It's um, <coughs> refereed, so you know people who know a lot about what the, their topic or who's written the Arkansas Encyclopedia online. If you have any questions, as you are doing your research, you can ask us at the Shiloh Museum. If we don't know it, we'll, we'll look it up. There's a lot of um, experts in different areas that meet at the Shiloh Museum. So just, just ask.
And if you Google some of those names, you'll, you know, Sequoia, um, John Ridge, the Rosses, you'll learn more about them. There was a teacher named Sophia Sawyer who was started the first school in Fayetteville. And that school was for Cherokee girls originally. So, um, like I said, the Cherokee really wanted to learn because education is important. That's how you move ahead. Any questions? Go ahead. That one's a drill. So if part of it's broken, but it's got a little tip down here. So if it was on a stick like this one, this little part down here. So if you do it like this, then in a piece of um, leather, like this one, if I kept going down, my hole would get bigger and bigger. But the reason this one's called a drill bit is because the hole, by the time I got all the way through, it's still the same as it started out at. So it would just make a small hole and then like for lacing. So this one's, this one's a drill as opposed to this one being an arrow or a dark point. Five questions? <laughs> so, um, good luck on your presentation.